This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and it has been a mind-blowing week for SpaceX with the successful completion of the much-anticipated 150-meter hop test flight of the Starship prototype SN5. Simply spectacular. We had the equally incredible conclusion to the Crew Dragon Endeavour test flight with the safe return of Bob and Doug splashing down off the coast of Florida. Finally, we had SpaceX's Starlink mission after many delays. Rocket Lab's investigation concludes with the results released into the cause of electric Electron's failure to reach orbit around four weeks ago, and Virgin Galactic announced exciting first steps into the proposed development of a brand new generation of high-speed aircraft. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. A beautiful sunrise early in the week captured by Mary and NASA spaceflight as we begin to explore the weekly goings on around the construction site since the last episode. As always, a huge thanks guys. We start off with what could be a new thrust skirt section here, as well as a new ring section that will be soon mated with the thrust dome. The super heavy high bay continues to grow and SN6 continues to occupy the mid bay, waiting for its moment of glory. A new thrust puck section was also spotted arriving and Murphy's Law kicked in with the only view slightly obscured here. Oh well, we get the idea from this great still shot. And we can also see a forward dome for an as yet unknown purpose. So yes, plenty going on in the construction area. Meanwhile, at the launch site, construction continues on several fronts as we have become accustomed to, but we also see a new perimeter fence here. And sadly, it looks like drive-by observations may become a little more difficult in the near future if this is anything to go by. SN5 continued to wait for its chance to hop, and come Monday we saw another attempt that went all the way down to the wire before aborting at T0 and detanking occurred. Elon, of course, later advised that there was an automatic abort due to a Raptor turbo pump spin start valve. The following day, we saw history being made by SpaceX with the much anticipated and long awaited successful first 150 meter test flight of the Starship SN5 prototype just before 7 pm on Tuesday, August 4th. Amidst a massive plume of dust and debris blasted from the launch stand, the Starship SN5 roared to life and rose gracefully into the air in a smooth motion over the adjacent landing pad. Of course, at the time, we didn't have the SpaceX footage being streamed live, so we didn't have this elevated perspective, and we were instead engrossed in footage by the incredible people out there on the site capturing this from different viewpoints. A few nervous seconds passed for us all as we awaited to see if the Starship prototype survived the landing, and as the dust cleared, there it was, SN5 standing upright and quiet, with the astounding success being celebrated together around the community. Twitter and YouTube live streams were going wild. What an incredible sight this was. In the footage that was released by SpaceX just a few hours later, we see this simply stunning footage from the perspective from the air and also under the skirt section. That one single Raptor engine there doing a wonderful job. I just love those tiny little temporary landing legs there, just casually flipping out prior to the vehicle settling into a safe landing. Afterwards, a bunch of information was tweeted by Elon Musk that gives us some good insight into what may come next. More information on the legs was announced with Elon to describing the next version of landing legs to come, saying that version 1.1 legs will be around 60% longer, which will provide better cushioning for the touchdown. We assume these will be used for at least the next three or four Starship prototypes. Then he added that the version 2 legs will more closely resemble the design used so successfully with the Falcon 9 rocket. We of course suspect that these will be much smaller, but using similar sort of technology. The need to upgrade to legs that provide a wider stance is obvious when we think about the locations the Starship is intending to touch down on in the future, such as the Moon or Mars, and as time goes by, other bodies throughout the solar system. These landing locations are certainly not going to be beautifully smooth, leveled concrete like we're able to provide at the test facility here. So what's next for Starship prototype development? Will it be serial number 6 here in the mid-bay that will undertake the next phase here? Let me know what you think in the comments. As far as we see from Elon here, they plan to do several short hops, which I suspect will be quite a lot higher than this, but still short in comparison to that 20 kilometer flight. I'm expecting perhaps within just a few kilometers in altitude. All this Elon says is going to improve the launch process before going to greater heights with the next prototypes that have body flaps. When asked when SpaceX will try a hop followed by taking off again, Elon simply said soon, which is the incredibly detailed measurable answers that we all love to see. Now currently the assumption there in my mind is that the SN6 here will be doing those multiple flights using three engines and a nose 
comb, then perhaps serial number 8 could have those body flaps installed. That will be exciting to see as it evolves. There are Starship components all over the construction site which will form Starship serial number 8 and a huge thanks to Brendan here sharing his great work to present how these sections are coming together. Follow him on Twitter to help support his work there. It's great to see these diagrams back in action again. Now the liquid oxygen header tank is already incorporated into the nose cone we see here and then this we believe will sit on top of these ring stack sections here. We can see the evidence on the outside of this ring stack that the internals have had stringers welded into it as we can see from the marks there on the outside. The top dome here comes next forming the top of the liquid methane tank and then the common dome has been stacked just recently onto a section of the liquid oxygen tank. Underneath all of that it isn't going to be long before we see the final skirt section including the thrust puck structure be stacked together for the future three Raptor engines to be mounted. And we've seen delivery of the body flaps just recently. So yes, SN8 is the one to watch right now. This could very well be the first to take a significant flight test to higher altitudes. Time will tell. Austin Barnard here also getting that acknowledgement and I couldn't have phrased this better myself about the event. This marks the beginning of a new era. Even though it does all appear as a small step to many out there unfamiliar with the bigger picture, this is actually a giant leap closer to humans settling on Mars than we were at prior to this test flight. And of course this is all very true. The goal of a fully reusable rocket that can significantly reduce the cost of mass to orbit is an absolute game changer for humanity. This will allow us to permanently settle other worlds affordably, encouraging trillion dollar industries to thrive in this new upcoming space economy. Now if you want to know more about the previous versions of the Starship and the huge effort it has taken to get to this point here that we've seen this week, I talk more in depth about that in this video. If you love this sort of space news and everything that comes with that, please do consider subscribing and taking a second to tap that like button. There is so much more to come. This is just the tip of the iceberg and what we are witnessing here is fundamentally going to change what humans will be soon capable of. At this point, things could begin to accelerate even more rapidly as these test flights become much more frequent. Now the other massive news for the week was Crew Dragon's safe return and it didn't take long for Crew Dragon Endeavour to make its way home last Sunday after its on-time departure from the International Space Station with Bob and Doug safely secured on board. After the deorbit burn was completed, Endeavour held true to its course heading for splashdown off the coast of Pensacola, Florida in beautifully calm seas. The weather conditions were just perfect and here we see the deployment of the drogue chutes as they slow the capsule followed shortly after by the wonderful sight of four successfully deployed main chutes that gently lowered Endeavour into the ocean. After being hoisted aboard the recovery ship named Go Navigator and lifted from the capsule for medical evaluations, Bob and Doug were flown to Ellington Field for a media event. You'll notice they both remained seated here as the effects of gravity on their bodies made standing very uncomfortable. I can't believe these guys actually managed to attend a public engagement like this just five hours after returning from the extended stay in space. Despite the physical effects and how they must have been feeling, you could really sense the joy and emotion from both of them. Doug here joking about making prank satellite phone calls just after splashing down to anyone they could reach and pointing to possibly Jim or Elon to accept the phone bill. In what Doug here described as an odyssey, it certainly looked like the reality of what they had just achieved was really hitting home. There was a lot of heartfelt thanks to the NASA and SpaceX teams for all their hard work and Doug certainly conveyed what an honour and privilege it had been to participate in the commercial crew program. Over to Bob and his even more eloquent speech full of thanks, appreciation, pride and excitement. As ex-shuttle astronauts he said how proud they were of once again having American launch capability. Describing themselves as old dogs who liked their old tricks, Bob gave thanks to SpaceX for being such a great partner and willing to listen to them when they had advice on ways things could be done better. This has helped to form a tight-knit team that ultimately brought about such a spectacularly successful mission. In wrapping up the speech there was a truly humbling moment there where Bob described their accomplishments as a victory and how they played a small part in this overall achievement. Truly inspirational stuff there. Congratulations to Bob and Doug, you just did an amazing job. Of course NASA's administrator Jim Bridenstine shared a few excited words of thanks to all involved and highlighted what NASA and its commercial partners can achieve together. There was an impassioned appeal
appeal to members of Congress to look at what NASA can do right now with what they have, as the House and Senate consider the biggest budget request in NASA's history. As Jim then introduced Elon, there was a brief mention of that very well-known tweet where Jim said it's time to deliver, and how Elon responded magnificently and delivered beyond what any of them had expected. And with that, it was a high five and over to the even more excited and overwhelmed Elon Musk who described the day's events as heralding a new age of space exploration. Sounding out of breath at times, Elon was reflecting on the full 18 years of development to fly people to orbit and back safely and how he was just so relieved that it all went as planned. And it was at this point the enormity, I think, of what has been achieved so far really set in. There was a moment of silence and you can just see Elon's mind just awash with so many thoughts here. I mean, the pressure to succeed must feel so massive, not only for himself, but the whole SpaceX team. And Elon summed up his speech praising this demonstration mission's success as a huge achievement for humanity. And in difficult times, with not much good news around these days, he hoped that it brightened people's day. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Did this brighten your day, or are you just like me thinking that this is an unbelievable understatement? After so many delays, we finally saw the rideshare launch of Starlink 9 with Black Sky Global's two microsatellites designed for Earth observations, accompanied of course by the next batch of 57 Starlink satellites. This booster designated B1051 had already flown previously four times, twice in 2019 with Crew Dragon's Demo 1 and the Radarsat mission, and two other Starlink missions this year. So this was the booster's fifth flight. I was beginning to wonder if this one would ever launch, as we've already seen nine delays and two scrubs. The booster landed successfully on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, some 630 kilometers or so downrange, but sadly Miss Tree and Miss Chief were not able to catch the fairing halves out of the air this time around. As we see here back at the start of June, Starlink 8 deployed 60 satellites and one of them was fitted with the sunshade visor which is designed to reduce reflectivity from the satellites while they're raising their orbits. Now in this new batch of 57 satellites, all of them have this sun visor fitted. Another fantastic view of the deployment as well, as we see them all drifting away there. In addition to the Starlink satellites, this was another incredible rideshare mission accompanied by two of the Black Sky Global satellites, which will have the purpose of providing sub one meter resolution pitches four times per hour. These rideshare missions are a fantastic way for SpaceX to further reduce the launch costs for the Starlink project. So even though 57 Starlink satellites were deployed rather than the full set of 60, this creates creates a lot of added benefit in the long term. It's quite incredible that there have now been 595 Starlink satellites sent into orbit at this point in time. And I highly recommend following the amazing work here by Elias, who has revamped the video again to show how all of these satellites are moving into position over time. Just awesome work there. Now, you'll no doubt recall just over four weeks ago, Rocket Lab launched their next mission dubbed PIX or it didn't happen. As we see here, the launch went as expected with some great footage along the way. As the Electron rocket neared the point of jettisoning the depleted batteries in a process called a hot swap, we lost the video feed, but the telemetry readings were telling us a story that was, well, bad. Sadly, the vehicle had suffered an anomaly and the Electron and its assorted payloads were lost. Rocket Lab immediately commenced proceedings to track down the cause with the assistance of the Federal Aviation Administration administration, and the results are now in. Well into the second stage burn, the engine performed a safe shutdown, a procedure that still enabled telemetry to be received. This assisted in fault finding and led to the discovery of an intermittent electrical connection. As it turns out, there was a heat buildup on the electrical component that led to the disconnection of the electrical system. Rocket Lab's founder and CEO Peter Beck announced that this was an issue never seen in prior launches. Thankfully though, there are now reliable ground testing procedures in place to catch any potential issues of this nature again. Rocket Lab and Electron's rocket are now cleared to resume launches again as soon as this month. Interestingly as well, they have just recently provided their new payload user's guide. And what is this that I see? Looks like we can now expect to see an expanded fairing option provided for non-standard missions with higher wait times. That looks to add an extra half meter of room there in the bottom area of the fairing. And Harry here showing a bit of a mock-up on what they may look like. Hmm, looks a little 
well, you know. So yes, it's really great seeing them in action continuously here, and as they announced just a few days ago, this week was also a big one for the recovery team. They have conducted a final drop test with the parachutes there performing beautifully and passing the tests with flying colours. We're now looking forward to the real deal, which Rocket Lab have said should occur on Flight 17, where they are going to attempt to catch and bring the Electron's first stage back home for the first time. So yes, certainly some great news there, and we'll look forward to more awesome missions into the future. Now, as you all probably very clearly remember a little over a week ago, the new Mars rover was launched with great excitement. Interestingly, however, a few hours after the launch, the rover experienced some hiccups due to the fact that the rover immediately starts using the deep space network for communications and the rover not being far enough away. The telemetry wasn't processed correctly due to the system not being calibrated to these strong signals. For the system, it was kind of like someone screaming into your ear. This was resolved very rapidly and the correct telemetry could then be received from the probe. This same issue actually has happened before in 2011 on the launch of Curiosity. Now the second hiccup came when the rover went into the shadow of the Earth and experienced very rapid temperature drops. Due to the temperature now falling out of the established parameters, the rover shut off all non-essential systems to ensure its survival sending itself into a form of safe mode. Now after exiting the Earth's shadow, NASA did a full health check on the rover and gave the command to come out of safe mode again. Soon after they had confirmed that the rover was back to normal operations. Now last week we talked about Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 interior which had quite a few people talking, but then during this last week, Virgin Galactic dropped news about developing this new supersonic jet which could be capable of travelling at three times the speed of sound. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but first I just wanted to say a massive thank you to my sponsor Brilliant here. I simply could not be where I am today making this weekly content without the continued support. What's better than that is partnering up with a brand that genuinely supports what I'm doing, not only by providing a wonderful service to promote here, but also by providing great advice on how I can get better at what I do for all of you here watching right now. I've recently completed a lot of the material on quantum computing here simply because I'm interested in these subjects. That alone has the potential to upend everything for the better, including better drug development or machine learning. Now, if you're like me and find these topics really interesting, there are loads of other topics on similar principles that we refer to on the channel here, often like gravitational physics or things like the rocket equation. I mean, we cover rocket launches every week and getting a good understanding of how the math in this works just gives you a much better understanding of how these missions are going to play out. So if you're naturally curious and you want to build up those problem solving skills, then do consider checking out Brilliant Premium. If you would like to help support me and would like to give it a try, just go to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people there will get 20% off for the first year of Brilliant Premium. You'll find that link, of course, in the description below. So yes, Virgin Galactic here announcing they are working with Rolls-Royce to develop engine propulsion technology for a brand new supersonic jet that could have the capability of screaming around the planet at over 3,700 kilometers per hour, which is going to make it much faster than even something like Concorde, which had its last flight way back in 2003. The cruising speed for that was around 2,155 kilometers per hour. Now I know this is not technically space news, but I can't help but love stories like this. Technology that really pushes boundaries of space flight as well as supersonic flight are exciting for similar reasons. That massive delta wing design looks very futuristic. Of course the render compared to how it may actually end up looking is not always exact, but this could be the start of an exciting new era in supersonic travel for those that can afford the price tag, which we can only assume at this point will be quite high. The jet itself is only going to have the capability for 9 to 19 people compared to 120 or so for something like the Concorde. So we can expect quite the luxury ride there. Now normal aircraft such as a 747 typically cruise somewhere between 35 to 40,000 feet or so, but aircraft like this will fly much higher, up around 60,000 feet where the atmosphere is much thinner. They can do that of course due to the higher flight speed. Like we see with re-entry from orbit, aerodynamic forces such as lift and drag are a function of speed cubed. So there are challenges not only with 
heat, but noise management, maintenance costs, emissions, and of course, economies of scale. Very best of luck to Virgin Galactic and partners for the massive challenges ahead there. A huge thank you to my amazing patrons here. I simply can't do what I'm doing here without you. Your generous support has allowed me to increase the time I can spend on this content, and I just can't thank you enough for all of that. Further help just allows me to do even more. If you like what I do and you'd like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. You can interact with me more directly via the included roles in Discord. You can check out some early access content. You can also have your name listed right here like these other incredible people. A massive thank you as well to my quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for all of these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be a part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. Today in the tile in the bottom left is my video last week talking about the Mars 2020 mission with the amazing assistance of Tony Bella's incredible work. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone as always for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.